So this is our uh, project three, Kennedy class two modification one. This is our blocked out refractory model. Uh, hopefully nothing lifted while you're duplicating with the silicone. The first thing I would do is freehand wax the finishing line. Now I had a couple of small bubbles on the palette from my refractory model. If this was the case, I would probably pour up another one, but for demonstration purposes, I'm gonna move forward. Freehand wax to the bead line, fill the bead line, the bead line with freehand wax, even slightly overextended. Now, in textbooks, they would say the palatal straps around a millimeter and a half thick in its thickest point down the middle. So what I'm going to do also freehand is down the center, create a stronger reinforcement thickness of the palatal strap. So I've done the reinforcement bead down the center, as well as filled in the bead lines. And then feather out each of those together and join them. Depending on the thickness of the stippled pattern sheet that we're going to use will depend on how much free-flowing wax you'll put up underneath. If we used a thicker sheet, like around 0 0.9, 0 0.8, then you could forego some of this extra wax I'm adding underneath, creating the thickness. But I'm going to be using about a 0.6. I'll use the alcohol torch to smooth it out. You can see that it's a little darker down the center. If it's a little thick in some areas, you can thin it out. Naturally, the wax up is at a, at a time where there's no need to rush. You can spend all the time that you wish to carve the margins, highly detailed ones. So therefore less time is spent uh, reducing the chromium cobalt when you're trimming. So you can see down the center line, it's a little thicker and very transparent until I get to the food line or the bead lines that are filled in. It's imperative that these bead lines are filled in so you don't have any bubbles, cracks, or imperfections. The second stage of the wax up, I would tend to start with the mesh lattice retention. They come in different sizes. You can see that I've got the smaller circles. You can use the larger circles. You could use the single chain. 
You could use this chain here, which is kind of oblong ovoid shapes. I happen to have these smaller circles cut out. I'm gonna lay it down. I'm going to reduce the pattern wax up exactly where I've done the block out wax. Keep in mind that I have room for prosthetic teeth and that the gingival margins of the prosthetic teeth should be very similar to the gingival margins of the natural clinical crowns or the natural dentition. So no sense adding extra retention over the edge of the, the ridge. If you have any uh, model spray accumulating from when you spray it from the, uh, from the warming oven, make sure you reintroduce it to the oven to eliminate any pools of spray or rosin as you'll be casting those. A few of you had the holes filled in last time. The next step is once I have the retention in place, I'm going to fill roughly half a row or a full row to the major connector. This is my internal finishing line. On the outside or the extension beyond the block out, I have my tissue stop. I corrected some of your block outs not to put the tissue stop here by the hamular notch as therefore would be hanging out the outside of the confines of the partial. Keep in mind that this is the framework and I've got in pencil here I'm drawing roughly where the acrylic flange will be. All the metal parts got to be within, within the whole denture base. They've got to be within the denture base. I'll do the same to the other side. That where I have that sharp edge replicated from my block out wax is my internal finishing line and I'm gonna adhere the mesh retention to the palette with a row or a half a row of retention circles or squares or grid. I'm gonna attach it with some free flowing wax. After I've done the major connector, first layer, the retention grids, then I'm gonna move on to my retentive and reciprocal arms. I've got this ledged from earlier today, so I'm gonna lay the profile pattern wax on top of the ledge, as you can see here from the side. The most important part of this class, which seems to get forgotten is the shoulder which is the area adjacent to the occlusal rest as I fill in the occlusal rest I may fill in slightly a bit of the shoulder to close it off the reciprocal arm has a ledge If your reciprocal arm does not have a ledge, be cognizant that the reciprocal arm is on or above the height of contour. I didn't seal the clasps down. The tackiness of the refractory model should hold them in place. And now I'm waxing up freehand the guide plane. The guide plane is usually within the confines of the occlusal table of the abutment tooth. As you can see, my guide plane here doesn't go too far buccal and too far lingual. It's pretty much the occlusal table or replication of the occlusal table of the bicuspid.
Now there's different types of class patterns. I mean, we have some here on a Christmas tree type ones. You can use these. They can be used for eye bars sometimes. But usually for molars, the larger ones are a little easier. Because of the trimming, deplating, polishing process, I would tend to err slightly on the thicker side of my class patterns. to give me some freedom in uh, polishing and trimming and if I need to reshape something. And there's the molar here. So my goal for everyone today is to get to this stage by the end of the day, have this ready to be uh, sprued, invested, And then possibly we could run a casting cycle uh, Friday's class. I don't think that would be too taxing to do so. Providing it is already in its investment ring and sprued and ready to go. That's all we'll be doing on Friday. We won't be waxing, have any time to uh, complete the wax up. So that'd be today's task. So I'm fusing the reciprocal retentive arm together. I'm filling in the prepared rest seat. I'm also sealing the shoulders of the acres clasps here with a little bit of wax, buckle and lingual. And then also being cognizant of the thickness of the guide plane as I've just thinned down. We're getting there. In the same fashion, I'll do the retentive arm, laying it on top of the ledge through my G-clasp. Be careful not to deform the profile of the wax patterns. I'm sure you've all figured out now what we are having in wax we're going to replicate in chrome. And I'm sure to this stage you've realized <laughs> how difficult it is to kind of uh, manipulate that afterwards if you've got large bubbles or big voids or pieces missing. This G-Class Pier starts at the occlusal table at the guide plane, right to the top. I've sealed the shoulders of the, of the rest on the mesioclusal to seal all the margins. Okay, to this point, really nothing different than we've been doing. Possibly the maxillary lends itself to a little bit of a different uh, lattice retention that we're going all the way to the back, unlike the lower. So I could take my uh, Zail Carver or any other instrument that you wish to kind of fine tune the wax up. I can scallop my rests slightly if I wish. It's a lot easier trimming them in uh, wax. So this is the trickiest part, I think, for most of us now, is adding this external finishing line. It can be done in two ways. One way is we add the finishing line first and then put the stippled pattern over top and then surgerize two at the same time. And a secondary way is to put the stippled pattern on first and then add the finishing line on top, which creates a, probably a better thickness but I think is more challenging for, let's say, the novice uh, partial denture waxer. 
So I've got my stippled sheet somewhat uh, cut out, but I'm going to do it the uh, first way where I'm going to lay my finishing line just over top of my, my cutout for my block out. As you can see, it starts here from the distal of the bicuspid, it goes vertical. Don't get lazy and go on a 45 degree angle. Then I take some free wax and only seal the palatal side of the finishing line. This is challenging because a lot of us will melt the 22 gauge round wax. So be really careful to maintain the integrity of the profile of the 22 gauge wax. And the same on the other side. I'm going to start up straight down the guide plane of where the reciprocal and rest meet. I'm not going to have any straight lines. I'm going to maybe create a little bit of a wave in the center of it. So it's more free flowing. There's no straight lines. And this here, what I'm creating is my external finishing line, which is the junction point between the acrylic and the chrome to the palatal major connector. Add some wax on the palatal side here, seal the two. Together, I'm creating a mechanical undercut on the carriage side for retention of my denture base. Now be really careful if you use the alcohol torch at this stage not to melt everything all together and maintain the integrity of the 20 gauge wax but I'm using a little bit of alcohol to blend it back into the palette slightly. Then I'm going to introduce the stippled pattern. Now, if you've got sharp fingernails, this is not a good time to use them. Be really careful and get this as close as possible. If you just push down, you'll stretch and thin out the thickness of the stipple pattern. This one here is actually 0.35. So if I stretch it out, I don't want to make it 0.2. I've seen some people use the uh, end of the pencil, the eraser, to kind of push this in. If you can shape an eraser nose here at the back of a pencil, if you don't want to, uh, you know, trust your big finger. And then once it's in place, carefully surgerize the palatal wax pattern, just distal, just distal by maybe a quarter millimeter of your bead line. If you leave it a little bit longer, You'll just have more to trim. If you have it shorter, then that's going to be insufficient size. Then you will lose any kind of paddle shape that you designed so carefully from the start. Now, I have the anterior and posterior bead lines cut to the appropriate length. Now this is the most challenging part I think for some, is that I'm going to heat up my surgical blade and then now I'm going to cut the palatal wax and the 22 gauge wax in half. 
with a hot instrument sealing the two together. Creating my external finishing line. If they're not sealed together, then I run the risk of having investment creep down between the two layers. I'm going to go back and tidy this one up a bit. I keep saying this step's important, this step's important. Well, basically all the steps are important. <laughs> this is this last one is very important that I'm going to seal the anterior and posterior uh, stippled pattern to the model. Therefore, no investment will come between the major connector and the pallet. I've left a little bit of the stippling wax beyond the bead line that I can heat up. and carefully seal the stippled pattern to the pallet. Now, I overheated the spatula here in one area. Go back with your carver or waxing instrument. I'm using a zeal carver and clean up any excess. If you use magnification chair side, this is a good time to look through that magnification and clean up any kind of excess wax over the margins. If I could really bring it to crown and bridge class where you have an overhanging margin, think of that in your rest preparations. That these intracoronal rests will fit within the confines of the clinical crown and not overextended creating to be onlays. Now, the last step is sprueing of this final product here. There's different philosophies of sprueing. Let's try a second one this time to be a little bit different, a little bit more uh, difficult, but we're going to take the square sprue. I mean, theories show that if we have a pallet in a rectangular shape, then we should use a square sprue, unlike a circular sprue, which would create more turbulence within the framework. We're going to use two sprues and unlike the lower, we're going to sprue at the thickest portion of the pallet, of the uh, major connector. And this is going to be really dangerous because I'm sprueing just inside my finishing line, if I can show you on this angle. The downside is I'll have an extra hole filled in, or two. What's O? Well, no, I think this will be eliminate any porosity. If we sprue back here in the classic way, if we put one here and one here and maybe one up here, we end up with having porosity at the joint. This way, if there's any porosity at the joint, it's in the edentulous area covered by acrylic. You'll never see it. So there's a method to my madness. The downside to this, though, again, is very difficult to wax here without ruining your wax up. At the same time, it's difficult to cut these sprues off without ruining your external finishing line. But you'll go back in with a stone or a diamond or a carbide and reshape the sharpness of your external finishing line. We're gonna do one on that side, we'll do one on this side. So we've got the square rectangular sprues joining together above the height of occlusion. If we're in a commercial laboratory, you'll rarely see them do the sprueing here because it's a lot uh, more cumbersome to finish the partial. It's a lot more difficult to get in here and cut these off. It looks better not to have them there from a finished product, 
but if we're thinking of the finished product as acrylic denture bases, you won't see what's underneath there anyways. And I'm gonna fuse these two rectangular sprues together. They come in uh, medium and large. I happen to grab this one in front of me. Since I'm only using two, I think this would be fine. And once I have these two in place, remember if I hold the model this way, I'm just surgerizing the sprues above the plane, uh, height of occlusion. I don't want to go any lower. I don't want to go any higher. It's not going to fit inside my investment ring. I think I will leave it at this stage because if I put it in the ring, you won't be able to analyze it if you want to come up and have a look. I'm also going to turn on the lights and go under magnification so I could clean up my wax up where I have a few small voids and some extra uh, wax.